Dear colleagues, hello everyone. My name is Maria Lepneva, and the topic of my presentation today is Refresh Revival, Success of Baohua Mountain in the 18th century China. As a young scholar, I am very honored to take part in today's conference and present some of the results of my PhD dissertation that I have just defended. Unfortunately, it was not prepared in English, but I'm happy to have this opportunity, especially because today's conference is held in honor of Professor Timothy Brook and his results, along with the work of Chunfang Yu, Jiang Wu, and De Wei Zhang, is the cornerstone of my own research in the history of Chinese Buddhism in the 18th century. In today's presentation, I would like, first of all, to introduce the problem that I'm dealing with in my research. Secondly, I will describe the history of Baohua Mountain in the late Ming and Qing periods. And finally, I will talk about the meaning of this history in the context of Buddhist revival. As a starting point of my presentation, I would like to show you an ordination certificate that is a document issued to monks who received ordination at Baohua Mountain, a nationwide ordination center for Buddhist monastics in 1919. It is introduced in Holmes Welch's famous work, The Practice of Chinese Buddhism. However, there the content is not discussed, but if we cast a, clever, a careful look at the content, we will see on the left side, there is a list of head preceptors starting from Gusin Rusin, famous survivor of ordinations, whose activities mainly fall into the period of late 16th to early 17th century. Then the second one is already a Baohua abbot. And then through the 16th generation abbot of the Baohua mountain who held that 1919 ordination. What is more interesting is the right side where you can see a list of important events Except for the first one, all the rest are dealing with the history of Baohua Mountain in the 18th century, including the orders of emperors for Baohua abbots to come to the capital and transmit precepts, visits of the emperors to the mountain and their gifts. All of these deal with the history of the 18th century. Why is this important? If we look at the scholarship, we will find that when discussing the Buddhist revival, scholars focused on a different period, the groundbreaking work of Chunfang Yu, and as well as some other works concentrated on four great monks of the late Ming, whose activities mainly took place during the Banli period. Then Timothy Brook, who focused on gender patronage as an important driving force of Buddhist revival, designated the period from the Wanli era to the opening decades of the Qing as the period of the active patronage from gentry. Although he focused on patronage, not on the Buddhist revival as it is, but this time frame ending with the turn of the 17th century was accepted by future researchers such as Jiang Wu and De Wei Zhang. They pointed out that Buddhist renewal should be divided into two stages. The first stage mainly coincides with the Wanli period and the activity of four great monks, the imperial patronage and the center of monks activities in Beijing. Whereas the second period is linked to the revival of Chan lineages, Jiangnan region and patronage of Chantry there. This is why when I saw that ordination certificate listing the main events in the history of Baohua mountain in the 18th century, I was very surprised because basically I would expect that the revival should have taken place in the 17th century and the most important event should have happened there. However, in scholarship, we can find an alternative view on the timing of the Buddhist revival. Japanese scholar Hasebe Yuki, who studied both Chan lineages and Vinaya lineages, pointed out that the Periods from Longqing to Wanli should be considered as a stage of transformation, whereas the next stage, the establishment and development of lineages, occupies the period from Tianqi through Qianlong, that is, up to the end of the 18th century. That's why I thought that it would be important 
to conduct further research in the history of Binaya School and Baohua Mountain as its key center during that time, to further understand the dynamics of Chinese Buddhism in the 18th century China and determine into what category it falls. Here, my theoretical framework is a model suggested by Dewei Zhang, who stated that there are three basic modes of existence of Chinese Buddhism, at least with regard to the Mingqing period. And each of these conditions corresponds to a certain level of enthusiasm with monastic Buddhism on the side of especially elite, and of course, also of people of all walks of society. And flourishing corresponds with high enthusiasm, stability with average enthusiasm, whereas depression corresponds with low enthusiasm. An upward movement, especially from depression to flourishing, is a renewal or revival, whereas a downward movement towards depression is a decline. So I would like to determine into what condition falls the history of Baohua Mountain as a representative of Binaya School in the 18th century China. To do this, I will now introduce the history of this Buddhist site in the late Ming and Qing period to trace its dynamics. The revival of Vinaya school took place rather earlier. Mainly it is linked to the activities of Gu Xin Rusin in the late 16th to the early 17th century who held ordination ceremonies despite of the ban that was imposed since the time of Xia Qing emperor. He received approval finally from the Banli emperor and he also designed the tri tribal platform ordination, the most widespread model for holding ordinations in China since then. His disciples gave a start to several lineages, but the best documented lineage with the greatest contribution to the development of the school is Qianghua lineage on the left here. And some of these its key abbots are his, listed here. They of course were the abbots of the center. Baohua Mountain, the central seat of this lineage, so San Meiji Guang, the first one was the reviver, and those are the others that followed him. They constructed an ordination platform on the mountain. They wrote Vinaya commentaries and developed ritual manuals, especially for the tribal platform ordination. The third abbot, Ding An Dezi, prepared the first version of the monastery gazetteer. In the early 18th century, Kangxi Emperor visited the mountain twice granting new name plaques for the monastery and its ordination platform, in effect, granting official recognition from the new dynasty. In 1713, the abbot was invited by Gentry to Beijing to participate in the festivities for the emperor's jubilee. And at that time, he also met with Kangxi Emperor in Beijing. As for the 18th century, my attention was focused on the abbot of Baohua Mountain, Wen Hai Fuji, who held this position from 1722 to 1765. He took part in many activities, but those that were initiated by him are listed here on this slide. He petitioned Yongzheng and Qianlong emperors to include works of previous Baohua abbots into the new edition of the Buddhist canon that was under preparation in 1730s. He compiled the genealogy of Nanshan school, the first genealogy of this revived Binaya school. He commissioned the gazetteer of Baohua Mountain, the new version that updated the old version of Ding An Deji. And of course, his hagiographies mentions his strict observance of discipline his regular ordination activities, developing of esoteric ritual, popular at that time, flaming mouth ritual, also updating the version of Ding and the Ji, and some small scale construction projects and requests for tax benefits. Here on the right, you see the pictures of the genealogy of Nanchan School and the gazetteer of Baohua Mountain. Wang Hai Fuji enjoyed considerable imperial patronage. Both Yongzheng Emperor and Qianlong Emperor offered support to him and to his monasteries. Yongzheng's patronage was mainly linked to ordination ceremony that Yongzheng ordered to be held in 1734 in Beijing under Wen Haifuji's guidance. To do this, 
Yongzheng ordered the repair and renamed a monastery in Beijing, which is currently the well-known Faiyuan Monastery. Also, Yongzheng appointed the next abbot of Faiyuan Monastery who would substitute Wen Hai Fuji after his leave. And this abbot was one of Wen Hai Fuji's disciples. So Yongzheng explicitly wanted Wen Hai Fuji's lineage to be settled in Beijing. Yongzheng set up a stele in Faiyuan Monastery in commemoration of these events and with discussion of the new name he gave to the monastery. He also granted several audiences to the monks, both Wen Hai Fuji and administrator monks who came from Baohua Mountain and the monks who received the precepts during the ceremony. Finally, Yongzheng Emperor selected 22 monks to continue cultivation in Beijing under his personal guidance. However, this group of monks were sent back to their original monasteries when a year later, Qianlong Emperor came to power. With regard to the Qianlong Emperor, he patronized both Baohua Mountain and Faiyuan Monastery as its sub branch in the capital. He approved Wen Hai Fuji's petition for inclusion of the treatises of Baohua Patriarchs into the canon and sent a copy of the new edition to Baohua Mountain. He granted Stella to Faiyuan Monastery and he visited Baohua Mountain six times, four times during Wen Hai Fuji's life and twice after his death. During these visits and in between, he granted precious gifts and composed poems dedicated to Baohua Mountains. And a lot of these gifts are written down into the ordination certificate that I showed in the beginning. Other lay patrons also offered considerable support to Baohua Mountains. Wang Hai Fuji's disciple who headed Faiyuan Monastery in the capital attracted quite a lot of literary patronage from Manchu princes and high profile officials. He used as a pose for this Wen Hai Fuji's jubilee in 1745 when he turned 60 sui old. So he attracted hagiographies and celebratory texts. Regional officials and gentry also took part in the patronage of Baohua Mountain. It included literary patronage, especially the text commissioned by Wen Hai Fuji, requested by Wen Hai Fuji, such as prefaces, compilation of Gazetteer of Baohua Mountain, and of course, still inscriptions dedicated to the events discussed below, such as tax benefits. So on the one hand, it fixed the benefit, but on the other hand, it discussed why the monastery is so important and so worthy of support. Reconstruction, the major reconstruction took place in, after a choir in 1735, which was led by Director General for the Grand Canal at Jiangnan, with participation of local officials, both acting and retired. Another reconstruction took place in, on the eve of the first arrival of Qianlong Emperor in 1755. It was also decided by officials and carried out by a magistrate of a local county. Interestingly, apart from these more shallow forms of patronage like literary patronage or, or solution of some financial or organizational issues, the patrons also participated in the management of monasteries. One such example are the invitations of local patrons to Wen Hai Fuji to profess the precepts in monasteries in Jiangsu and Anhui. And another example is when local pa patrons invited Wen Hai Fuji's disciples to reconstruct monasteries. I, there are two such cases in Suzhou and Yangzhou. And these cases are actually very interesting because they start fundraising, they start the reconstruction, well, those late patrons actually. And then when Qianlong Emperor arrives during his Southern inspections, Further patronage is attracted to those monasteries. As they're visited by the emperor, they receive new na name plagues or other gifts. Finally, let me move on to the problem of the Buddhist revival and how I can designate the condition of Baohua Mountain. To do so, I would like to review how the scholarship determines the characteristics of 
the condition of the Buddhist community. And I group these characteristics in four categories. The first category is material conditions of monastic life, mainly dealing with the physical state of the monasteries, their buildings, rental fields, and of course the availability of Buddhist books, especially the Buddhist canon. When there is positive dynamics, high level of interest in Buddhism, reconstruction or construction is carried out, land is acquired, and the new editions of Buddhist canon are prepared, printed, and distributed to the monasteries. In a negative scenario, the structures come in decay, the land is sold or encroached, and the canon is of poor quality or not available. The second group of characteristics is the spiritual life of the clergy, which mainly refers to the Buddhist knowledge and Buddhist activities on the side of the monastic. In the positive case, there's earnest desire to revive or to carry out education and practice. There can be interest in genealogical history, the history of a school. It can often be observed that prominent masters appear as leaders of change. And Relevant texts are compiled, including treatises on doctrinal matters, recorded sayings, monastery gazetteers, or genealog genealogies. In a negative condition, the level of education is poor, the discipline is in neglect, the history of tradition is not interesting, and finally, there are false claims of spiritual achievements. The third group of characteristics is about the institutional reform of monastery administration, that is how the position of the abbot is passed down. The three main models, private monastery, public monastery, and the time of transmission monastery. And during the time of revival or high interest, there is usually a transition towards public or time of transmission model, which depends on the general intellectual climate. Of course, when Chan lineages are revived, it will be transmission to Tha there would be a transition to a karma transmission model. And if the sectarian rival rivalries are to be overcome, like in the time of the four great monks, probably the public monastery model will prevail. And in case of the Dharma transmission model, one more characteristic is the formation of networks of monasteries based on the same lineage affiliation of their abbots. In a negative scenario, probably the private monasteries would prevail and unified administration of a monastery would collapse with separate groups of Donger families controlling separate parts of its property. Finally, the fourth group of characteristics deals with the late patronage. These patrons may include emperors, princes, court women, eunuchs, as well as scholar officials and gentry. Of course, emperors are in special position to exert their influence on the monastic community they can, in a positive scenario, they can loosen restrictions, invite monks to participate on large scale public occasions, prepare and circulate new editions of Buddhist canon, grant nameplates to monasteries recognizing their official status. And in a negative scenario, they of course can impose political restrictions and even carry out persecutions of Buddhism. A common Modes of patronage, both for emperors and the other patrons, include literary patronage, financial or organizational support, especially for construction projects. Also, an interesting type is instruction of monks or challenging their modes of cultivation or their understanding of the doctrine. And finally, a very deep involvement is also participation in monastery administration, such as appointing the abbots of monasteries. And in a negative case, is a general lack of interest into Buddhism or even encroachment of monastic lands and revenues. Now, as we benchmark the history of Baofa Mountain with these characteristics, we can see that revival, the movement from the depressed state towards the flourishing state took place in late 16th and 17th centuries when Gusin revived ordinations and the lineage of his followers took shape at Baofa Mountain and they wrote new commentaries, ritual guides, established new disciplinary rules, and started to conceptualize the lineage history. In the 18th century, Baohua Mountain not only preserved the tradition established by its earlier abbots and maintained its material structure, but also significantly improved its status, both through imperial recognition and the systematic effort of its abbot, Wen Haifuji. 
except for the emperors, other lay patrons mainly provided support to Bafa Mountain either on request from monks or in the course of executing their official duties. However, there are examples of local patrons assuming active role in enhancing discipline and reconstruction. Whereas the patronage of Yongzhang Emperor or Wang Hai Fuji may be an exceptional case, the southern inspections of Qing emperors clearly provided a chance to a number of local monasteries to improve their status and attract further attention. Now, the overall conclusion here is that at least some Buddhist lineages, such as that of Baohua Mountain and some of its local sun branches in the 18th century exhibited the state of flourishing, which was supported by the mechanism revealed by the Wei Zhang, when a positive influence is produced by direct involvement of the emperors, as well as by the trigger role it plays in determining the actions of other patrons. 18th century in the history of Baohua Mountain combined features of the first and second stage of previous Buddhist revival. Similarly to Wanli period, the emperors assumed leading role as patrons, inspiring enthusiasm in wider range of elite supporters. At the same time, with regard to intellectual pursuits, expounding on disciplinary matters and polishing ordination procedures gave way to genealogical concerns of school history and lineage awareness, echoing the sectarian rivalries between Chan lineages in the 17th century. In a nutshell, this research on the history of Baohua Mountain in the 18th century drives me to reconsider the idea of the overall decline of Chinese Buddhism in the 18th century. Probably further research in the monasteries and monks in this period will show that under certain conditions with the patronage coming from Yongzheng or Qianlong emperors, these lineages would be able to successfully survive and even manifest the characteristics on the flourishing state even in the 18th century China. Thank you very much for your attention. I would be very glad to answer your question and engage in the discussion.